Okay. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to tonight's program, um, Rediscovering Oscar James Dunn, presented by Professor Brian K. Mitchell. Um, we're excited to have him here um, with the City Archives, and we're also excited to have this co-sponsored by the New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries, which is the home to Oscar James Dunn, Oscar James Dunn's final resting place in St. Louis, too. Um, just a short introduction for uh, Dr. Brooke Mitchell before uh, he gets started with the presentation tonight. Um, he is currently an associate professor of history at the University of Arkansas Little Rock and an associate faculty member at the Anderson Institute on Race and Ethnicity. He's the author of numerous papers, book chapters, and books, including Monumental, Oscar Dunn and His Radical Fight in Reconstruction, Louisiana, which we highly recommend you check out from the library or grab from Amazon or wherever you would like. Or if there's a good website, drop it in the chat, Brian. Um, and then, of course, um, He's a graduate of the University of New Orleans and, of course, a native son and a descendant of Oscar James Dunn. So this is a really exciting meeting of genealogy and history and a really important one, too, that we're happy that we're able to share with you tonight. Um, as for New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries, they do manage 13 Catholic cemeteries in the city and have been in operation since 1789. And as I've said, uh, they are the uh, home to Oscar James Dunn's final resting place, um, a tomb in St. Louis number two. So I'd like to hand it over to you, Brian. Thank you very much. Um, give me just a second. I'll pull up the uh, PowerPoint that I've created for the presentation. Uh, the title of the presentation is Oscar James Dunn, uh, Louisiana's Forgotten Hero. And the reason uh, it's titled that way is because for most uh, people my age, uh, they probably grew up, spent their whole lives, went through um, uh, elementary, through high school, and probably never saw an image of Dunn. Uh, there was probably a very little discussion of Dunn um, and it isn't until recently that uh, people have even really paid attention uh, for the most part to what was going on in Reconstruction in New Orleans and how important Reconstruction New Orleans is on a national level. And Dunn is a perfect example of this uh, need to uh, study Reconstruction, particularly from the vantage point of New Orleans and the vantage point of Louisiana politics. Oscar James Dunn um, served as Lieutenant Governor of the state from 1868 to 1871. Um, he was also acting governor uh, for uh, several months in 1871. Um, this is often ignored. In fact, uh, if you Online and Google first black governor, um, the picture that will come up will be a PBS pen packs picture, uh, not Oscar Dunn. And, and there's a, a particular reason for this. Uh, Oscar Dunn, when he becomes uh, acting governor, he does this in, in a manner that puts him at odds with the then governor, um, Henry Clay Warmoth. Henry Clay Warmoth will injure himself on a boating trip, and Dunn will uh, be forced to take uh, over as acting governor in his absence when he goes to pass Christian. Um, in his absence, he will also break into his office, uh, have a locksmith go into his office. Uh, he will begin uh, acting as acting governor, and this will cause... Uh, Henry Clay Warmoth to return from past Christian early on crutches and try to undo everything, all of the laws um, that had been passed while Dunn was acting as acting lieutenant governor. And that will call that will even include the rearrest of a police officer that Dunn will pardon from prison. So he, he sentenced and he's sentenced to prison. And uh, Dunn will issue a pardon for uh, uh, this police officer 
and uh, Warmoth will have him immediately uh, rearrested. Uh, despite uh, Dunn serving in these capacities as the nation's first uh, black executive officer, uh, very few people know anything about him. In fact, the historic record has been quite bare for a number of years. Um, the two existing papers that carried a lot of weight on Dunn one done by Marcus Christian and the other done by a historian by the name of Perkins um, had contradicting information within them. And a, a large portion of, of what I did during my dissertation was to look at um, the work that had been done by these two earlier historians and try to find out if they were existing primary sources, which had either been overlooked, ignored, or not known about uh, during that time, that would shed light on these inconsistencies uh, that exist in the historic record. When I first uh, was brought in contact with Dunn, I was in second grade, I was seven, eight years old. And every day after school, I would go to my uh, great grandmother's home and she kept scrapbooks and magazines everywhere, um, much like other people's grandmothers do. Um, and having no television at her home, she did not like television. Uh, I would go through magazines and these scrapbooks and photo albums over and over again and I came across a really old um, scrapbook. And in this scrapbook uh, was a newspaper clipping. And this was the clipping that I found. And it, it tells us a little bit about Dunn. Um, this clipping comes from uh, the National Republican. And this piqued my interest, even as an eight-year-old. Um, and what I noticed uh, about Dunn's name is he shared the same last name as my great grandmother. So I asked her, you know, what's her connection to this individual? And she noted that her late husband, uh, her late husband's uh, father, uh, grandfather had been a cousin of Dunn's. What we know about Dunn uh, and you know, the way that uh, my research has changed the historic record is uh, first, it's formulated a more concrete um, a date of Dunn's birth. Uh, at, in some records, you'll see 1826, in other records, you'll see 1824. But I was able to find uh, the oldest records relating to Dunn, and those appear in an index. Uh, just below the city hall and the notary uh, and the notary indexes. And in that index um, was a notation that many people believed was lost forever because the notary uh, where uh, Dunn's sale took place, uh, his records had burned down, uh, but uh, people had forgotten about this index. And in the index, I found a notation on that notary entry. And that uh, index, it tells you who sold a slave and who purchased that slave. And the conditions it gives in very sparse wording, the conditions or terms of that cell. And in the records, uh, I was able to find uh, the name George P. Bowers, who was a commissioned merchant that lived in the Bucure. And Bowers had owned um, Oscar and his mother. And during the term of his ownership, Dunn's mother, a woman by the name of Mary, will fall in love with and uh, have another child, a female child by the name of Jane, uh, with a free black man that migrates to the city of New Orleans in 1819 from Petersburg, Virginia. Um, this free black man was named uh, James Dunn. And James Dunn uh, was working for the theater impresario James Caldwell as a theater, uh, a stage 
carpenter. He built the scenes and the sets for the first American theater that was here. And in 1832, um, after purchasing uh, the family, his children and uh, his wife, Mary, from uh, Bowers, James Dunn will emancipate the entire family in front of the police jury. This is a very, very important um, point in Dunn's life. And that this is a point of transition that I believe impacts the remainder of Oscar Dunn's life. Uh, first of all, he gets a last name. Before that point in all records that I found, he's referred to only as Oscar. Uh, later on in uh, government records, I will discover that he adopts uh, the first and last name of his stepfather, um, assuming the new name Oscar James Dunn. Uh, the, his emancipation also opens him up to education for the very first time. And Dunn re receives two forms of education in his lifetime. Um, both of these educations will be extremely important to his later future. And both of them uh, are received, he could have only received both of these as a free person of color. Uh, the first education that Dunn receives is noted by one of his lifelong friends, a fellow Mason by the name of John Parsons, will note in um, an obituary that he writes of Dunn, that Dunn has attended an English school. And uh, in attending this school, he, he, he notes that Dunn will attend this school from the, the point in which he's freed up until he is 14 years old. And at the, at the point that he's 14, his father uh, realizes that he needs a, a, a training where he can produce a livelihood for himself. So Dunn will be apprenticed to two master plasterers at that point and will begin his training as a plasterer. Dunn loved academics, according to Parsons. Uh, Dunn was an avid reader. And uh, according to Parsons, if Dunn had his way, he would have done something other than plastering. Uh, yet, um, James Dunn, it is impossible uh, for a young man in the city of New Orleans without leaving the state to acquire an education that will allow him to do anything outside of the arts. So he, he apprentices him to these master plasterers and Dunn begins another phase of his life. And this is a phase wherein he is a, an artisan in the city. Dunn practices, um, he practices plastering until 1860. And uh, just before 1860, in the 1840s, Dunn's father will die and Dunn will abscond from a, a job that is being done by a firm that he's working on. He's contracted to a firm and he absconds from this, this job site and an arrest warrant is put out uh, for Dunn's safe return. We do not know whether Dunn was arrested or not. Uh, what we do know is that by 18, by the 1850s, before the Civil War, Dunn is practicing um, music and has become a music teacher. Uh, we do know a little bit about where Dunn gets his musical training and the reason we know about Dunn's uh, musical training is also uh, John Parsons. John Parsons noted that Dunn would become a master at playing guitar and he begins uh, taking guitar lessons first from his employer, um, the master plasterer that he had worked under, but actually later on moving to an Italian master that was residing in the town, a man by the name of Torna. 
and Dunn will study under Jonah until he is capable of taking on his own students. Uh, Dunn will teach music uh, in the city. And uh, he, it appears that Dunn ha was very content with the teaching of uh, music and the pupils that he was taking on. He was able to um, sustain uh, himself and uh, pay his bills. Um, and then in 1860, there will be an incident that will make Dunn transition once again in his life. And this incident uh, involves another free man of color, a man by the name of Martin, who is also a music teacher. Uh, Martin will be arrested and he's arrested after a former actress, a woman by the name of Thayer, um, calls the police on Martin. Martin, she maintains, has taken her daughter, who was a former student of his, and with her, and uh, they have a child together. After a short investigation, it is discovered that Martin um, is sleeping with a number of his female pupils, and all of these pupils are white females. Uh, he is promptly arrested and thrown in prison. And there is a commit. There is a, a meeting in a square where a number of men proposition tar and feathering Martin. Uh, however, Martin is saved by the sheriff in the town, uh, and that is where the story of Martin ends. Uh, Dunn, however, is shaken up by the arrest of Martin and chooses to abandon his posts as a music teacher in the city. Um, and it's at this point that he returns briefly uh, to being a plasterer once again. Um, however, uh, Parson notes that Dunn is quite unhappy with this idea of returning back to plastering and he notes that Dunn would have much uh, rather uh, a life where he could sit down and read and uh, use his intelligence. There are two institutions that will play a huge role in Dunn's success as a politician. Uh, one of these will be his affiliation, membership, and leadership within uh, St. James AME Church. Uh, St. James AME Church is the largest AME church in the Deep South at the time. And uh, it's the largest Black church in the city at the time. Uh, Dunn is also a Mason at this point. And his relationship with um, the Prince Hall Masons, what would become the Prince Hall Masons, is such that he rises in the ranks very quickly. Um, Dunn will attribute uh, much of his uh, political prowess uh, that he begins to develop uh, to the leadership that he learns within um, the Masonic uh, family. And this notion of a fellowship will also lead him to have the lifelong friends that will be political supporters of his and a network from which he could fundraise and draw support. Dunn becomes uh, after, and it's important that we point out the importance of 1866. 1866 will have, the South will see two uprisings, two uh, revolts will take place. The first of which will take place in the city of Memphis, and the second of which uh, most of you are familiar with will take place in the city of New Orleans. Um, uh, it's often referred to as the Mechanics Hall um, uprising or riot. Um, this will send the US uh, Congress into a fluster over what to do and the potential that the Civil War could reignite uh, fearing that the violence could be more widespread, um, Republicans in the U.S. Congress will decide uh, to militarily occupy the entire South and replace the Democratic leadership that was already in place with uh, a legal, 
a military leadership that was more loyal to um, the Republican government that was installed in DC. Um, once the military leader and the first general to actually control the city of New Orleans after 1866 will be Philip Sherman. And Philip Sherman um, sees the potential for garnering black support and he doesn't trust the white Southern Democrats, uh, many of whom had been a party to or were for, or really aware of the revolt that was going to take place in 1866. Um, because he doesn't trust them, he begins to appoint people he can trust. And Dunn was one of two men that is selected um, for the first post in the city. And those posts were, um, on two boards and that's what is, what was the city council then uh, was comprised of two boards, a junior and a senior board. Uh, Dunn is selected for that junior board uh, and the senior board uh, appointee, African-American appointee was Francis, du, uh, Francis Dumas, uh, a black, also a black former soldier. Um, uh, he would sit on that upper board and Dunn would sit on the lower board. But this isn't the only position that uh, Dunn will hold before becoming Lieutenant Governor. He will be installed as the assistant uh, recorder for the second district court. And at, in that capacity, he will be the first African American in the city to serve in a judicial capacity. And if you, if for those who have read my dissertation or those who have read a copy of Monumental, uh, that first court case that is overseen by an African-American uh, comes with a degree of, of comedy to it because uh, at that point, none of the courts recognize the right of a black person to have a voice in a court, let alone be the judge, be the presiding judge in the court. So in his very first hearing, both the defendant's lawyer and the prosecution object to Dunn's capacity as serving as judge. And he will hold both uh, in contempt of court and apply fees to both, uh, fines to both of them. Uh, in 1868, uh, Dunn will serve as, uh, he will be selected, nominated as the Lieutenant Governor um, and he will run as Lieutenant Governor. And this comes also with a degree of controversy. Uh, Dunn had been a huge supporter of the Afro-Creole community there. And when uh, Francis Duma, the man who served on the senior council is not selected as the their candidate for governor, uh, that contingency decides to run him as an independent. And Dunn has to make a decision at that point whether he will pull out with the Afro-Creole contingent or whether he will um, accept the nomination uh, from their rivals. And Dunn is quite fraught in this. And it, uh, there's a lot of discussion, uh, critical discussion of you know, what Dunn decides to do. But I was able to find a, a book that shed light on this in a way that none of the other historians had considered it. And the book was written by um, John Mercer Langston, who was here and at the convention at the time. And uh, according to Langston, Dunn was initially going to pull out. Dunn had just recently married. Uh, he had adopted children at this point. He had a successful business um, at this point, and he was going to um, leave the political arena. Uh, and it's only at the insistence of Mercer and his wife that he took up the nomination. According to Mercer, he and Dunn walked up and down Canal Street for an entire night 
and uh, returned home in the wee hours of the morning uh, to Dunn's house. And they sat on the stoop for a while. Um, and Mercer said he begged and begged uh, Dunn uh, not to abandon his people. And, and that told him that it was incumbent upon him to run for this position. And Dunn's wife hearing um, their conversation through the window came out up this post telling him that it was his responsibility uh, to his community and his people to take up this position. Um, this uh, Dunn's willingness to accept the nomination will for a little while put him at odds with the Afro-Creole community. However, uh, this dispute uh, would reconcile itself after Warmoth becomes governor and, and one of the first acts of opposition that Bournemouth does, um, one of the first acts that the legislature under Dunn would pass is called the Isabel Act. And the Isabel Act is also referred to as the Civil Rights Act of 1866. Uh, when it gets to uh, Warmoth's death, everyone believes Henry Clay Warmoth We'll sign it. He's a Republican. The black vote had put him in. Uh, Dunn had personally vouched for him. But when that bill reaches Warmoth's desk, Warmoth will veto the bill. And uh, Warmoth vetoing the bill was the beginning of a Republican Party schism. Um, and now Dunn and his Afro Creole uh, counterparts have a rival that um, threatens the uh, civil rights of all Blacks in the state. So um, where they had had disagreements among uh, one another at that point, those, do, those disagreements become trivial to the idea um, that Warmoth is now blocking the Civil Rights Act. And it's at that point that an opposition party or opposition faction within the party uh, begins. And this opposition faction will be known as the radical faction of the Republican party, uh, the opposing faction led by uh, Warmoth will be called the conservative faction of that party. And the, uh, this dispute will continue and uh, will only grow. And one of the, the aspects of its growth happens uh, in 1870 when we had this dis that opening discussion about Warmoth hurting his foot. Um, once Dunn is acting governor and uh, many, particularly many white Democrats begin to see Dunn uh, as a potential leader who is not going to sh uh, totally shake up the foundations of the state and put them in harm's way. Um, this puts Warmoth on very precarious footing. Uh, many Demo uh, Warmoth believes that many Democrats might support a Dunn administration, and he begins to actively try to undermine the Dunn faction and to ensure that he will get the nomination as governor. And one of the things he does that he does to do that is as they prepared for uh, the convention, a warm of uh, now a multimillionaire from all of the dealings under, under the table dealings he has done will um, put deposits on all of the available halls in the city where a convention could be held, believing that if he controlled the venue, he could control what went on within the venue and who was it um, allowed to stay in the venue and who could be kicked out. Um, the Dunn faction will realize uh, the precariousness of that situation and will move uh, the convention to the Custom House. Um, and the custom house will then be under guard uh, by US troops. And it's often that convention is often referred to as the Gatlin gun convention because quite, uh, once again, quite literally a Gatlin gun is placed outside of the convention. And many uh, 
and Dunn's uh, and Wormuth's camp maintained that they were not allowed into the convention. Um, in 1870, there will be two conventions, two separate conventions of the Republican Party in the state of Louisiana, one held by the conservatives and the other held by the radicals. And um, this division that we see within the party will also play out within uh, factions of the government. So when we start talking about how this graph get passed around, um, how is, uh, well, Warmoth is able to pass graft and positions to people to get their support. Uh, Dunn doesn't have that control at this point. The only thing that Dunn can do in order to make sure that his supporters um, get something is the control of contracts, um, of, of printing press, the everything that is advertised by the government, all government action has to be um, printed in newspapers. So one of the things that the Dunn faction figures out is um, we control the printing of all government information and we can offer that to um, our supporters who all have newspapers. So the printing bill shoots up astronomically in the state uh, to as a method. And I believe that it was used as a method of uh, supporting or giving graft uh, to uh, those people who are within the Dunn faction. This uh, dispute between Dunn and Warmoth would continue and it would grow more bitter as they got closer to 1871. And um, in 1871, it is proposed, in 1870, it's proposed that uh, Warmoth could be impeached, and the Dunn faction begins moving toward the impeachment of Warmoth. And just as we believe that, um, just as they're on the eve of the impeachment of Warmoth, Dunn becomes uh, gravely ill after attending uh, a state function, a dinner, and uh, he dies mysteriously, very quickly afterwards, leading his supporters to believe that he could have been poisoned um, to ensure that he would not become the governor of the, of the state in Warmoth's absence. Um, another thing that leads people to believe that there's some foul play is the reaction to Dunn's death by his family. Instead of having uh, autopsies done, the family will move very quickly uh, to have done buried. And the burial of Dunn um, is lamented by all factions of the city. And in fact, um, the leading uh, Confederate general uh, Beauregard in the city will maintain that if he had to choose a person that he would prefer to be governor and he had to choose from Warmoth or Dunn, that he would select Dunn over Warmoth. Um, that's a huge endorsement coming from the initial position that Beauregard had had toward Dunn uh, immediately after he took office. Um, What's important to take away historically about Dunn um, are a number of firsts. And one of these things is, is Dunn is the first person that is openly discussed by a major party as a potential uh, vice president candidate. So he's the first African-American considered as a running mate for a major candidate. And that consideration is found within the letter books of Ulysses S. Grant um, as letters uh, go to Grant suggesting a potential run with Dunn in the 1872 election. We know that that couldn't happen because Dunn dies in November of 1871. Dunn's funeral takes place on November 23rd of 1871. 
and the state will declare the day uh, a day of mourning. All offices of the city government were closed. Democrats and Republicans alike gather uh, by the tens of thousands to view uh, the governor's, the lieutenant governor's funeral procession. There will be bans, there will be fraternal orders, military orders, uh, lodges, uh, political groups, and um, the funeral is considered the largest funeral ever record, recorded in the city's history. Estimates of the crowd range from 10,000 to 50,000 attendees. When we talk about the importance of Dunn and how he was regarded outside of the city, I turn us to an article that ran in the New National Era, a Washington DC newspaper. Um, and this is an article I took from the November 30th, 1871 edition. Um, Gifted with remarkably sound judgment, there was no man in Louisiana whose opinion and counsel upon the questions of state were as often sought by honest men of both parties. His parliamentary talent has long been a theme of admiration and for the dispatch of business in the official chair, few men in the union have been as equal. Um, I thought that was a very nice comment, but it, it gives us some idea of the regard that Dunn has um, both inside of the state and outside of the state. Uh, one of the things I love to point out to my students is um, that history is a living thing and it, history can be affected by who is in control of the narrative. And uh, a quote that I love to use is a quote by W.B. Du Bois, with sufficient general agreement and determination among the dominant classes, the truth of history may be utterly distorted and contradicted and changed to any convenient fairy tale that the masters of men wish. And I think that's an, an important uh, thing for us to remember, particularly now as uh, we, we may be seeing history rewritten once again. I was asked to, uh, the issue of Dunn becoming uh, popular or people re wanting to research Dunn again happens largely because of an NPR broadcast that took place. And this NPR broadcast took place right after um, Mayor Landrieu. Uh, made the decision with, along with city council and the people of New Orleans to remove monuments uh, to the Confederacy. And, and, and uh, I guess uh, when we talk about the uh, Liberty Monument, monuments to white supremacy in the state, um, with that decision to remove the monuments, a larger question was opened in the city of New Orleans. And that is, what should occupy our space and what should fill these vacant spaces if we remove uh, these monuments. And I was asked to come on NPR because someone read the dissertation and um, took away from it uh, that done, there was a, a monument um, for Dunn that had been allocated by the state. It had been voted upon, monies had been put aside under the act that's on your screen now, it's Act 57. And this monument was never erected. And the question that a lot of people had is why didn't the monument become erected? Why, why wasn't it ever put up? And you know, can we go ahead and put up a monument for and tribute to Oscar James Dunn since it's already been approved by the state legislature. And uh, yes, in, eight, in 1874, um, this act was approved um, to erect a monument and that it, it called for the formation of a monument association to be developed 
the allocation of funds in the amount of $10,000. There was also an allocation of funds for a befitting tomb. If um, you will recall, a Dunn is put into a tomb, but the tomb that Dunn is put into is not his own. It belongs to the Cassinade family. And uh, he is given a slot there um, because no one had prepared. He was uh, still a rather young man. No one had um, envisioned that he would die. And the family's decision to bury him so quickly did not afford time uh, to build a new uh, gravesite for him. So the Cassinet family allowed him to be buried in one of their crypts uh, that the family owned and was maintaining. Uh, so there is a, a bigger discussion now is taking place on how to remember Dunn. And for those of you who have kept up with current affairs, uh, Washington Battery Park that overlooks uh, Jackson Square um, has been approved for renaming and uh, in honor of Oscar James Dunn um, in the forthcoming months. And I look forward to that ceremony taking place. And I hope uh, that uh, some befitting marker is placed in that, in that uh, park. Uh, that will be dedicated to Don. I wanted to uh, shed a few highlights of the book, I, and uh, this is the cover of Monumental. Uh, Monumental was purposefully done as a graphic history. Yes, the manuscript initially was written as an academic text, and uh, you're welcome to read my dissertation. It's free for download. Um, if you would like the details and the footnotes and uh, to be able to go back and trace back the sources that I use. But I thought it was important that the narrative of Dunn uh, and the discussion of reconstruction be open to um, a younger audience, uh, particularly people in middle school and high school, uh, because many of the concerns that we face today as a nation are similar to um, the concerns that faced uh, the state of Louisiana during Reconstruction. Um, in both instances, we have a polarized community. In both instances, we have a community that's divided by custom and by race. And in, most, in both situations, um, we have this idea of history and legacy uh, that people want to maintain. And I think that it's really, really important that we pass this narrative on because it not only tells students how they got, how Louisiana got to where it is now, but it also uh, could serve as a cautionary tale for what can happen to a society um, if it refuses to compromise, if they're if there are constant refusals and denials of civil rights and access to polls. Um, the remaining past, uh, pages are images that come from uh, the graphic history. Um, this is a depiction of Dunn and his office. This is at the convention. Um, this is at the convention of 1870. Uh, some of the features that are important for teachers in the graphic history are, are thing, reasons that I think it would be a, a good uh, book to be used in the classroom include uh, the endnotes. I uh, made sure that when uh, using the notes to uh, uh, cite sources that were easily obtainable um, and sources th uh, that students could go back or classrooms could go back and look at uh, the New Orleans Republican, easily accessible. Uh, most of the newspapers that we choose, we choose to use in the text and the footnotes are also uh, very um, accessible to students. Also incorporated maps, um, and these maps allow you to follow 
important landmarks in Dunn's lives or in places where specific events take place. And I made sure to color code um, these locations. So if teachers want to, or tour groups would like to take uh, groups of students out to locations that still exist, um, you're able to find those. So the, the markers that are in purple are locations that are, are still there, that you can still go and see today. Uh, there is a timeline that follows Dunn's life and it mirrors Dunn's life, important uh, events in Dunn's life from his uh, birth to his death. Um, and it does that alongside major important events nationally. So you're able to see how Dunn fits into the larger uh, timeline that is the, uh, reconstruction history. And last but not least, there is a glossary because many of the terms, uh, while we in New Orleans may be familiar with what the Afro-Creole community is and the Anglo-African community, uh, there are people, uh, particularly out of the state, who will not be as familiar with those terms. Uh, we all know what Fallberg means, or, or, or many of us know what Fallberg means, but if you're in uh, upstate New York, or if you're uh, in Ohio in a classroom, you probably will not. Um, they also give teachers a way of really gauging whether students are paying attention and um, keywords that they could possibly use on tests. I want to go ahead and I'll end my uh, PowerPoint there and I'll open the floor for discussions. Excellent. Thank you so much, um, Brian. That was that was incredible. Um, yes, everybody, if you have um, any questions or any comments, if you could, please uh, type them in the chat um, and I can read them and uh, Dr. Mitchell can answer them for us. I'll give folks a chance to type. And if you are more comfortable um, asking your question out loud, I've um, now allowed you all to unmute yourselves if you'd like to. Um, if, if you could um, use the raise hand function um, in your uh, Zoom chat box. And don't be shy. Hello, hello. Is that Bob? Yes. You, did you have a question, Bob? Yes, I did. And I apologize for coming in late. Uh, I came in about 20 something after. Thoroughly enjoyed the discussion and want to hear it more. So I have two questions. One, I noticed it's being recorded. So when can this be and what other methodologies could one see this rerun of this uh, uh, dissertation? I'm so glad you asked. Um, so early next week, we'll have it uploaded to the library's YouTube. Um, if I drop that link in chat for you um, and you just click on it and then bookmark it or subscribe, it should show up next week. Let me uh, grab that for you real quick. Excellent. And, and may I ask the second question? Yes. Uh, in conjunction with the allocation of funds or at least a designation of a monument for uh, Mr. Dunn, was there any description of what said monument might entail, other than just an allocation of funds, uh, either with a pl placement or, like I say, actual description of what it might be. No, there are no known records of the committee. It would be wonderful if somebody would stumble upon minutes or of the committee um, meetings. Um, and there are a number of noteworthy uh, individuals that sat on that committee. 
Uh, but as as of right now, uh, no records are known to exist of in, in the meeting at the, the association. Accordingly, with the uh, renaming of the artillery park, I was hoping that maybe either they could create uh, at least a somewhat of a statue of bust, or if there's another one anywhere around that may not be well known to reallocate or remove and locate it in that particular park to really give some significance other than just a title, a visual thing there. I agree. I mean, I'm hoping, uh, I, I've been doing a lot of foundation work lately. You know, with, with the cemetery, we've been, we've been working to try to set up a perpetual maintenance fund for Dunn's tomb. So there's a donation page for that. Um, the historic New Orleans collection has set up a donation page for Monumental to try to ensure that the book uh, finds its way into classrooms, regardless of whether those students or those schools can afford to pay for them. So to make sure that they're available to them. And I'm sure at some point uh, I'll work with some organization to try to raise money to erect uh, a monument uh, befitting of the Lieutenant Governor. So I'm sure that'll be a project as soon as the park is dedicated um, that we will begin working on. And if I could tax you on two more points, but I'm not monopolizing the whole uh, talk session. I don't want to do that. The, the other, the initial question would be, uh, when you mentioned about his tomb getting the archdiocese or whoever the cemetery funds, um, it, did I not catch, was he ever re-entombed from the Kazanev uh, monument or cemetery to, uh, plot, excuse me, to his own, or was it just dedicated as his? No, no, he still shares the tomb. He still, um, the $5,000 that was assigned to erect a befitting tomb for him was also not allocated. You, you have to remember that in 1873, we have the Colfax Massacre. 1874, we will have the Battle of Liberty Place. So um, yeah. it, everything becomes very, very unsteady in the politics in the city. One of the things that done did not do, unfortunately, was pick a successor. So um, there's rivalry within the, the radical faction over who is the rightful successor to Dunn. And uh, that will just give an opportunity for dissension in the ranks. Um, and eventually there, there, there is no comparable leader that emerges to rival what Dunn had been for the state. Excellent. One last, or am I time's up? Well, um, we do have two more folks. Go ahead, go ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the courtesy. We can come back to you, Bob. Um, let's let other people, um, we'll do the other folks' questions first. Um, our first question is from Tammy Hansen. Um, she says, you mentioned that Mr. Dunn has a connection to Prince Hall Freemasonry. I actually presented a paper on Prince Hall and his connections to the major civil war battles. Does your dissertation go into further discussion into Mr. Dunn's Freemasonry connections? Um, yes, uh, my dissertation goes into his Masonic Oh, I'm sorry, we're breaking up a little, or that might be me. When he was first raised as masonry in the state. Um, the question of whether uh, Masonic lodges will be integrated. They were uh, all white lodges and all black lodges prior to uh, reconstruction. any of the American Grand Lodges, its dispensation will come from France and it will be an, an integrated lodge. And both the all white lodge and the, um, the black lodge are both against this integrated lodge for um, 
specific reasons. Done is against the lodge first because it's it's clandestine. It's established by a foreign lodge in the, the Orient of France. And the other reason that he's against this uh, establishment of an integrated lodge, he sees this as a potential threat to um, the political base, because you have to remember what I said about his involvement in Freemasonry. It, it, it was under Freemasonry that they were able to organize uh, much of the voting in the state and much of his political support came from uh, being the Grand Master of the Lodge. And he was Grand Master, twice Grand Master of the Grand Lodge of Louisiana, the Eureka Grand Lodge. Um, and he saw this as definitively a, a stretch to try to strip um, Blacks of their autonomy and to try to uh, sl uh, strip them of this secret meeting place where they could organize. And, he, you know, therefore, you know, a lot of people think it's strange. Why would he be against these integrated lodges? And he's against these integrated lodges because he believes that they threaten uh, the political arena and their ability to organize and their ability to draw support from the Masons. Great. I'm just going to hop in because Amanda had to step away for a moment and read the next question. Um, they said, can you comment and comment on and contrast the general characteristics of Republicans and Democrats during the Civil War and Reconstruction era? You mentioned radical Republicans in your presentation and further explanation of that term would also be appreciated. Uh, when we talk about the radical Republicans, the rad radical Republicans were often uh, comprised of the freedmen, um, the Afro Creoles in the city who were extremely different politically. Their aims from the recently emancipated freedmen were, were very, very different for the Afro Creoles, who had, uh, many of whom had been free before the war. Um, they took a very uh, French revolution sort of approach to equality, liberty for everyone. And they had envisioned an opening up of the state so that all organizations, all uh, venues would be open to them. Um, Dunn realized uh, quite pragmatically that this wouldn't happen and that uh, it was probably more expedient for Blacks as a group to start to try to have economic independence. And one of the ways he tried to achieve economic independence was the formation of something called the Bakery for the People, which was modeled after German collectives. And it was his hope that uh, Blacks would pay money into this collective and collectively purchase uh, businesses. Um, and they, they purposely named it a bakery because the staple of the diet they maintained was bread. And it seemed only natural that if you could control the purchase of the staple, you could build wealth, you could create jobs, and you could control destiny. Uh, Dunn was quite aware that if Blacks did not build wealth and did not own their own businesses, that it became increasingly harder for them to say that they were free or to control their future. So he was um, bent on making that happen. Unfortunately, the freedmen were not sophisticated enough to really grasp or trust enough about the bakery of the people. So that idea would fall apart. There are a number of other ideas that are that are embraced by Dunn that are meant to, to drive people together uh, into a more integrated society. And Dunn saw education as paramount to er eroding racism. He believed that if children began to go to school together uh, they and they grew up together, they'd see each other as equals. And that's why he pushed so hard to integrate the schools. And his children were the first children to integrate the public school system. A lot of times we we look at um, Central High or we look at uh, the Brown decision as the, in, the point of integration of public schools. And I have to remind people in, 18, in 1870, 
uh, done will integrate the public schools in the city of New Orleans, sending his own children as the test cases to those schools. Um, so that's important. And uh, when we start talking about the conservatives, the conservative faction was mainly um, a white faction uh, uh, comprised mostly of, of whites in the city. Uh, many uh, had been Scalawags. They had been members of the Republican party who were also Southerners and did not believe in racial equality. And um, the reason why it took Dunn and his group by surprise that Warmoth would be a party to this faction is Dunn brings Warmoth into the Friends of Universal Suffrage, uh, the organization that they found before a political office. And um, Warmoth convinces them that it's probably best to have a white person at the helm of of your political aspirations because he could go to DC and talk to people there for them and he could open doors for them. Um, and that's um, only partially true because the Friends of Universal Suffrage had successfully sent uh, two Afro-Creole men to uh, DC to present a petition and their names to Washington just prior to Washington's assassination. In fact, in Washington, and I'm not Washington, Lincoln's assassination, and just prior to Lincoln's assassination in his last public address, he makes specific comments about these free men that have come to visit them and about the fitness uh, that he sees, the potential fitness he sees in uh, black men who were particularly educated like the men that visited him and men that had loyally served the union as having a limited enfranchisement. I know that was a bit rambling. I hope it hit on some of the comments that... Um, I, no, I think all of this is like excellent illumination for and complimentary for sure. Um, uh, we have another comment. Um, thanks, Brian Mitchell, for your excellent presentation. One comment with respect to friction that develops between the Tribune and Dunn over an article that appeared in the newspaper. I have located a surviving copy of the Tribune article in question, long believed lost to history. Is that... Um, does that sound familiar? Yeah, that, like I said, uh, when Dunn decides to take up the nomination, uh, this puts him on sort of uneasy fitting with people who he had grown up alongside um, uh, and had been a part of the universal suffrage group with. And when many people within that organization begin to see this as a betrayal you know, you you were with us and now you're with the Anglo-Africans. So um, there are a number of heated articles that go between uh, Dunn and members of the afro Creole, um, uh, particularly the, the journalist community in the city. And I would love, um, I would love to take a look at that if you, Mark, I know this has got to be Mark, um, if you've uncovered that, please um, shoot it to me, and I'd love to take a take a look at the newspaper article. It's on its way to you. Okay, thank you. Excellent. Um, that's exciting. Uh, so we do have a, a couple more questions. Um, I know we're we're gonna try to wrap up soon, but um, so if you have any additional questions, go ahead and get them in now. But, um, I'd like to I'd like to take a second to thank Jari, uh, Henry. Uh, uh, Jari, you here? You, could you unmike for a second? You're welcome to if you want to, Jerry. Okay, <laughs> ja yes, what, I'm here. <laughs> ja Jari sent me something that was fantastic the other day, and it came totally out of the blue. Um, one of the things that he sent me was I had always wanted to know when Dunn's father died, because I could find no notation of it. 
Um, but he was able to find um, an index of the internment of Dunn's father, which allowed me to connect the date of Dunn's father's death largely and correlate it in some way to uh, his absconding. So, you know, I, I'm thinking there might be some connection between Dunn's leaving work and his father's death because they take place in the same year. Do you know where, where was he interred? What cemetery? Um, it's, I believe it's, it's Gerard Cemetery, right, Jari? That's right. Both James uh, and, and, and uh, his mother are in Gerard Street, okay. or were in Gerard Street Cemetery. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I was surprised to see that there were a number of duns in that tomb, you know, so I was, I was very surprised at that. Do you know if their interments were transferred to um, Greenwood, is it, or Hope Mausoleum? Only the white interments were transferred to Hope. The um, people, the inter unclaimed interments of people of color were um, transferred. What is the name of that cemetery in Metairie? Um, but if the families claimed the remains, then they would have moved them individually to whatever tomb that they wanted to. I believe it's Greenwood, is that correct? No, oh, I no. forget. I could look it up really fast, but. I think it's fascinating because, you know, I'm, if people don't know me, I'm the uh, Director of Public Engagement and Development for New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries. My name is Heather Beniciano. Um, it's interesting because Dunn was not a Catholic, but he is interred within St. Louis Cemetery number two. So that's why I was questioning um, where his father was interred. And it makes sense that he was in a Protestant cemetery because um, they were not Catholic. And it's just, it's fascinating the way that history turns out because it Jari, could have been Jari very says, likely that he would have been there. Jari noted Providence Park. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Providence, Providence Park. Park. Yep, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, I know where that's at too. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you, Jari. <laughs> um, we have a couple more questions. Um, I, th these are maybe a little broad, but um, what happened to his descendants? You were mentioning integration of schools by his children. Which schools did uh, they attend? Uh, his children, his daughters were sent to Madison School for Girls, for, and it, it's no longer an existing school, but it, um, there was a school called the Madison School, and that was the first school that was integrated in the city. And um, it does say, what were their professions? I think we've addressed the next one, which what is the relationship of the tomb he's buried into him? Um, but what, what were their professions that we know? His children's professions? I, I believe so. Okay. Um, very little is known about his children. In fact, I started doing more research on what happened to his wife and where uh, her remains were laid to rest and the particulars around her death. And after she will marry uh, one of Dunn's Masonic brothers after he passes, a man by the name of uh, Henri Birch. And when Birch dies a few late years later, she will go to visit friends in the North and will stop uh, in her hometown, which was Cincinnati, Ohio. And while she is visiting family there, she will fall ill and die. And she's buried right next to her father in, in, a, city, in a cemetery in Cincinnati, Ohio. Come on. All of her, it, and she writes a, there is a will for her that is on record there. And all of her worldly possessions are not left to her children, but were left to her sister and her sister's children, which opens up a huge question of, you know, why would someone leave all their wealth to, you know, more distant relatives than your immediate children? And I haven't been able to figure out that uh, I'm still doing research, I haven't been able to figure out why that happened. Uh, 
I I do I think I have tracked down her daughter, uh, one of her daughters, Franny, who um, is often listed under under the last name Frailton, and um, the census records, I believe I have tracked her outside of the country in South America. But I'm continuing to do research there and until I'm sure that's the same individual. Uh, I don't want to lead anybody on a on a wild goose chase at this point. <laughs> um, did, did we have a voice question or 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 no? I, I thought I heard one. I wasn't sure. I guess not. Um, um, well, with that, let's let's wrap it up with the the very last question tonight, if if that is okay. Um, do you think the Masons and other organizations help as a stepping stone for political aspirations? And I think the short answer is yes. But almost oh, definitely, being a part of uh, we know in New Orleans the influence churches can have politically, uh, particularly in certain communities and being a high ranking member of a church or someone who's regarded well by the church itself, uh, its entirety, uh, can give you a considerable uh, amount of votes. And that seems to have been at least one layer of Dunn's voting base where um, these Protestant Blacks who are willing to vote for him. It's, Interesting when you look at the writings of Dunn and you look at the few speeches that exist, that he doesn't ever harp on religion. Um, and he does, I believe he does that very quite purposefully. He realizes that there's this huge divide between Catholicism and Protestantism in the state. And in order to make sure he does not uh, ruffle any feathers on either side, he always talks about Christian values instead of a particular church or religion. And that just, to me, showed how shrewd he was of a politician at the time. Uh, when we talk about uh, establishing the, the first uh, voting registrations, Dunn digs into his own coffers and pays for the, the whole apparatus and establishes the network for voter registration out of his own money. And he relies heavily on the lodge systems throughout the state. So he relies heavily on brothers throughout the state to run these uh, voting and registration points throughout the state. And that that's one example of, of how Masonry, you know, takes this very, very active role in politics, and it, it's it's not accidental that many, uh, particularly of the uh, the Anglo Africans that are involved, and even some of the Anglo, the Afro Creoles, are part of the Masonic family. There, there, many of them are members of the subject lodges that uh, are under Dunn's control. And for the most part, um, these men are extremely loyal to Dunn. There will be a controversy in the lodge and, and the, the person that he has um, an argument with is a quite noted, noted figure in New Orleans and in the, in, in the communities in New Orleans. And that's Noble, Jordan Noble. Uh, Jordan Noble had um, established a number of lodges and had gone out of the jurisdiction to get dispensations instead of getting those dispensations from the Grand Lodge. And Dunn uh, actually will have um, a number of arguments. There'll be some, uh, some heated language that will go back and forth and letters that will uh, be passed back and forth. But what surprised me was uh, a lot of the correspondence within the lodge still existed. And I was able to get that from the Masonic Library and Archive in Iowa. So um, the history of the founding of the lodge here, the names of the founding brothers um, that established the, the Prince Hall Lodges here. Um, 
some of the early uh, letters that went out to other lodges um, were all printed and uh, were all available through the Masonic uh, archive there. And that came as a huge assistance. Excellent. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. This has been really informative. And I, I feel like with every question, you gave us another like excellent chapter and in insight. Um, it's, it's hard to sum up a book. Uh, <laughs> the dissertation is 300 something words. I think the first draft was 350. And then we had to shorten, you can't have a 350 page graphic history. So we <laughs> We shortened it to, I mean, it's over 200 pages long. So for uh, a graphic history, that's quite a considerable length uh, for text. Um, and we tried to stick uh, as much as we could to um, the historic record and to connect those sources for uh, scholars that might want to follow this. And, and the reason that's so important is this is the first book length piece on Dunn. And there were a number of people um, who were sort of aching for something like this to come out. And when they began to check the sources, um, they were surprised that there were a lot of sources there that no one had seen uh, or heard of. So I guess the, the biggest endorsement I got, and you, you hate this, you know, tout the endorsements or, or people liked it, but, you know, when Eric Fauner read it and he liked it, I was very, Please with myself and Edward Ayers, you know, um, when when both of them sort of gave it the thumbs up, and I I was pretty happy and content with it. Exciting, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and again, I just I just want to um, reiterate that um, uh, everything, including a link to the graphic novel, and um, actually a lot of uh, links that. Um, that were shared earlier um, are all going to be on our main program page. Um, in the meantime, I do, let me just drop a few more links before we go. Um, this is the YouTube um, video on Monumental, the making of a graphic history. Um, Tammy does have a question about how much information we have in the archives about Freemasons. Not a lot original, um, not a lot of original materials. Um, as far as original materials go, we have a couple of items in the rare vertical file, which are Grand Lodge of Louisiana certificates of memberships and a couple of certificates, a little pamphlet, combined roster of city lodges. And then um, in the first- Yeah, Amistad, Amistad Library has a collection there that's substantial. In fact, there's a, a photograph of John Parsons, the, the man who writes the obituary that had known Dunn his whole life. There's a, a Christmas card with uh, a photograph of him on the on the exterior of it. Here is the link to Amistad for everyone. And uh, let me uh, get this. Um, let's see here. Can I share, can I steal the screen for one minute to just show the, um, the tomb page? Okay, so this is one of the links that Amanda has posted and that's going to be on the website, um, the programming website, and this is our on the New Orleans Catholic Cemetery site, a page set aside for a fundraising initiative to place the tomb of Oscar James Dunn under perpetual care. The tomb was fully restored in the year 2000 um, using funds raised by Friends of New Orleans Cemeteries, which is a local group that's still active. So we're trying to raise uh, $4,500 and that will secure the future of the tomb. There's a few slight repairs that need to be done before it could enter the program. And we're just gonna front the cost of those. Um, so the money raised is strictly going towards the perpetual care. New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries is gonna do the minor repairs to get it up to speed to enter the program. But it's something that we feel really strongly about and would love to have help with. Um, once it enters the program, it will be protected in perpetuity. 
any issues that it has in the future will be repaired under its perpetual care contract. Um, and it will just secure the physical legacy of Dawn on the landscape. And I think, you know, if you are able to donate, that would be fantastic. We have a campaign progress bar, which I have to update next week. We have raised a lot more than $25, um, but it's not automatic and I have to get with our accountant. But below you can enter your credit card. You can also call the New Orleans Catholic Cemetery's office, which um, is on the bottom of the screen. Our phone number and our email will be made available to you. But if you wanna pay by credit card, there's a couple different options for um, amounts and you could also put in a custom amount if none of these are something that you'd be interested in. But please share this um, with those that you think might be interested in helping us. And we look forward to the day when it will be under perpetual care. We hope to have a small ceremony um, once it does enter the program. Thank you. Oh, that's excellent. Thank you, Heather. Um, here, I'm going to put up um, what the, what's essentially going to be where we uh, catch all the links for um, both this, for both the perpetual care page, as well as um, connections to uh, resources by uh, Dr. Mitchell and resources from New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries and other additional, um, you know, things related to Oscar James Dunn in our program tonight. And that is this link. And with that, um, I want to thank everybody for coming. I want to thank you for um, being here to uh, learn more about Oscar James Dunn with us. I want to thank you for supporting New Orleans Catholic Cemeteries, as well as the city archives at New Orleans Public Library. And I hope you all check out the page and all the links. I'm going to be adding more next week. And again, um, the recording of this program will go up towards the end of next week on our YouTube channel, which is again linked on that one last link I have put in the chat there. Um, and yes, once more, thank you, Brian. Thank you for all of this. Thank you guys. And I'd be happy to come to the ceremony when, you, uh, when it does reach uh, its threshold for perpetual care. You will definitely be invited for sure. Oh, thank you guys. Um, you all enjoy the rest of your night and um, we'll hope to see you at the next one. Take care. Thank you. Bye everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Heather. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night.